Our great president of the United States, Joseph Biden, he went on Seth Meyers last night. Before he did, though, he decided they decided to go get ice cream at 30 yes, Rock, I as, guess. You, as you do. And it's just a bizarre scene unfolding. He gets asked about Israel and makes some actually consequential news. news about his expectations of this temporary ceasefire. Let's just watch how this all unfolded. Can you give us a sense of when you think that ceasefire will start, sir? Well, I hope by the, the beginning of the weekend. I mean, the end of the weekend. At least my, my, my national security advisor tells me that we're close. We're close. It's not done yet. And my hope is by next Monday, we'll have a ceasefire. I mean, I don't know. There's just something optically about yeah, talking a, about something so extraordinary, ser extraordinarily serious where thousands, if not millions of lives are on the line while you're casually eating an ice cream cone with Seth Meyers that it's just yeah, strange. It's like, what? It uh, just <laughs> is very uh, discordant, I guess would be the right word there. So in an attempt to, I guess, uh, silence the critics and show he's really, really up to the job, et cetera, he decided to do this softball interview with Seth Meyers on Late Night One Sit for, you know, a journalist at a real newspaper or anything that might be even remotely contentious, like what would have probably also been a softball interview in front of the Super Bowl. But he'll go on late night television and do a little banter with Seth Meyers here. He did address a bit of his uh, Israel policy. Let's take a listen to some of what he had to say. Because again, we see this horrible, every day we see these horrible images out of Gaza. And is there a path forward? Is there a safe future for the people who live there? There is a path forward with difficulty, but here's the path forward. Look, first of all, there are the hostages being held must be released. And if we've got a, at least a principal agreement, there'll be a ceasefire while that takes place. Ramadan's coming up, and there's been an agreement by the Israelis that they would not engage in activities during Ramadan as well in order to give us time to get all the hostages out. That gives us time to begin to move in directions that a lot of Arab countries are prepared to move in. For example, Saudi Arabia is ready to recognize Israel. Jordan, is, uh, Egypt, uh, there's six other states. I've been working with Qatar. And the, the bottom line is that I'm not, I think the only way Israel ultimately survives, and I make no bones about it. I get criticized for having said a long time ago, you need not be a Jew to be a Zionist. I'm a Zionist. Where there's no Israel, there's not a Jew in the world to be safe. But here's the deal. They also have to make take advantage of an opportunity to have peace and security for Israelis and Palestinians who are being used as pawns by 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 Hamas. Israel has slowed down the attacks in Rafah. They have to, and they've made a commitment to me. They're going to see to it that there's ability to evacuate significant portions of Rafah before they go and take out the remainder of Hamas. But it, but it's a process. And look. Israel has had the overwhelming support of the vast majority of nations. If it keeps this up without this incredibly conservative government they have, and Ben Gavir and others, most I've known every major foreign policy leader in Israel since Golda Meir, they're going to lose support from around the world. And that is not in Israel's interest. So there's a lot there, actually, to say, Sagar. Mm -hmm. First of all, on that last piece, you know, he wants to frame the problem with Israel as just being specific to these few extremists like Ben Gavir, just like with his um, settler policy. I'm going to sanction these four violent settlers as if the problem with the settlements is just this fringe violent group, not the entire policy of settlements, which has been ongoing since the Golda Meir <laughs> days. Um, he wants to paint it as like, oh, it's just the problem is just this government, which obviously is not the case, especially when you look at the fact that, you know, all of the coalition members of the, the war cabinet, even the ones that were quote unquote moderate, you know, people like President Isaac Herzog, who's out there saying there's no uninvolved civilians, like the overwhelming majority of Israeli society, regardless of where they situate themselves on the domestic political spectrum, is on board with this, um, you know, outrageous assault on the Gaza Strip. So I think it is very disingenuous and really gaslighty to try to pin this just on, oh, it's just Ben Gavir, it's just these few extremists, that's the real problem here. That's number one. Um, number two, uh, on Rafa, I noticed the language has shifted from originally the Biden administration was really warning Netanyahu against going into Rafa at all. Mm -hmm. 
Now he's saying, oh, I got this promise from BB that he's going to evacuate the civilians because, you know, they've done such a great job of protecting civilians thus far. So I noted that shift in language, which we've seen some of before. The other thing, Sagar, I find so disgusting this language about how if there wasn't in Israel, oh, I'm glad you picked up. That's what there wouldn't be a Jew in the world who was safe. We have a huge Jewish diaspora here. And the idea that you are president of the United States and you don't think you can keep your own people safe is a real admission uh, that is, you know, uh, that is sort of scary and disgusting all and pathetic all at once. But the other thing is here in terms of Jewish security, I would say that there is no country on the planet that is making Jews less secure than Israel. Think of those comments we played the other day of that, like, you know, women's equality or whatever minister that Mm -hmm. they have in Israel who said she wants, she's proud of the ruins of Gaza. She wants the children and the grandchildren of these Palestinians to know not what Israel did, what the Jews did to them. There is no country in the world that is fomenting more likely future extremism and radicalism against Jewish people than Israel is right now. So on every level, I found those comments so obnoxious, abhorrent, disingenuous, and just wrong that I can't even begin to describe it. Well, but that that line, too, has always bothered me, and it's like a typical Bidenism. So I just have it in front of me. There are 7.6 million Jews in the United States who are living peacefully, freely, as all other American citizens. There's only 9.3 million people who live in Inside Israel. And if I have my math right, what is it? Around 20% of those are Arab. So yeah. what do we got? We have probably have the same number of Jews who live in the U.S. than who live in the state of Israel. So if Israel didn't exist, then the Jews in America wouldn't be safe. There have been Jews in this country since the Civil War. Yeah. You know, there are people, Jews who fought on both sides whenever they didn't exist. They were proud patriots, and they have a deep tie to our American history. And they had nothing to do with the state of Israel, just so everybody knows. But this is the problem. You know, the Israelis want it the both ways, too. They have it so that you have a conflation of Judaism and of their own sovereignty, which basically allows Israel not to be treated as a nation state like any other through which there are pluses and minuses. They imbue themselves with the religious sense. And then same thing here is that you conflate anti-Zionism, quote unquote, with anti-Semitism and with Jewish safety here in America. Now, if the Jews themselves want to make the decision, that's your right as an American. But for an Irish Catholic president to say that, I think it's anti-Semitic. I do. Because again, it's a conflation of a nation statehood with the identity as a U.S. citizen. I would say the same thing about India. You know, India's sovereignty or whatever has no place on my rights as or my conception or my identity as an American citizen. It just happens to be a place my family is from. There are a lot of countries that don't exist anymore. Silesia or whatever. Not, it's not a country, but a region that people emigrated from to the U.S., but they don't think of their territorial integrity of that you know, place, let's say the Balkans, Yugoslavia, as conflating with their own identity and safety here in America. And that's the exact problem where a lot of domestic Jews want to have it both ways, but now the president wants to have it both ways too. And I think that's really wrong. So I think part of this um, little, you know, late night appearance and whatever also has to do with the fact that the primary in Michigan is today. Mm -hmm. I think that the Biden campaign people have stopped deluding themselves about the idea that, oh, all these people worried about the, you know, our complicity in genocide in the Gaza Strip. They'll get over it. They'll get over it. They'll move on. Don't worry. That's just this fringe group. They're really not that big a deal. Um, I actually saw a poll that from yesterday from Emerson of the Michigan Democratic primary electorate that had roughly 10% of voters planning to vote uncommitted, which is pretty extraordinary. That is a lot. And almost 30% of young voters between 18 and 29 planning to vote uncommitted. I mean, this is like an ad hoc movement that just sprung up that has next to no money behind it, et cetera. And yet you have enough sentiment that it could potentially today take a significant chunk of the vote. So I think part of the why he's out there, you know, doing his little ice cream ceasefire bit is to try to persuade people that, oh, I'm really interested in peace. Oh, I'm really standing up to the Netanyahu government, et cetera, et cetera, when it's going to take a lot more than that at this point. You're going to have to actually change policy, not just pretend to be interested in peace for one late night appearance. In a sign of how concerned they are, 
about, you know, what the vote total will be in Michigan for uncommitted. They sent Governor Gretchen Whitmer, who was way more popular in the state than Joe Biden, by the way, out to try to get the vote out, to try to convince the Democratic faithful that they needed to go, they needed to show up, they needed to vote for Joe Biden. Let's take a listen to how she is making the case. Well, I'm, I'm not sure what we're going to see on Tuesday, to tell you the truth. I can tell you this, that um, Michigan has been so fortunate to be the home of a robust Arab, Muslim, Palestinian um, community and a robust Jewish community. We've lived in harmony as neighbors for decades. And there's a lot of pain all across all of these communities um, because of what's happening halfway around the world. This is, I think, a, a very high stakes moment. I am encouraging people to cast an affirmative vote for President B Biden. I understand the pain that people are feeling and I'll continue to work to build bridges with um, folks in, in all of these communities because they're all important to me, they're all important to Michigan, and I know they're all important to President Biden as well. Sounds like you're um, preparing for a sizable portion of the vote being uncommitted and sending that protest message to President Biden. You know, Dana, I'm just not sure what to expect. Just not sure what to expect. I mean, that's very interesting. So she doesn't want to set any expectations whatsoever mm -hmm. for how it's going to come out. I mean, you can imagine... First of all, very clear, she's a much better politician than Joe Biden is. You know, she went she out of really her way. She really should have been picked, like to, for vice president. She'd be yeah, way better than yeah. Kamala Harris. Yeah, I mean, you know, in any case, you can see she's going out of her way to try to express her sympathy for Arab American populations in the state, which she knows is a significant constituency in Michigan and very important to her electorally, not to mention Joe Biden. So, you know, she's really trying to express this sympathy while fully supporting the guy who is doing all the terrible things that are causing them so much pain and grief and causing them to turn away from the Democratic Party. But I found it extraordinary both that they felt the need to send her out to a, a variety of cable news shows, and I also found it quite extraordinary that she would not commit to what percent of the vote she thought uncommitted would get. She did not want to set any sort of expectations so that they can spin after the fact, you know, if uncommitted does get 10 percent of the vote. Oh, that's not right. that much. That's not that significant. In reality, that would be, I think, quite significant in the context of, you know, voting for literally uncommitted over the guy who was president right now on this uh, this sort of like ad hoc shoestring effort that sprung up is uh, it's it's interesting. It's hmm. interesting for the a protest vote. We'll see what happens. No, I think they're I think they're worried about it, Crystal. I really do. Um, and because there's no other reason to have that. Also, I'm not sure if you saw Beto, what he had, he had some sort of uh, like mea culpa. He put out a statement. He's like, actually, I do support President Biden, oh just to be God. clear, just so okay. everybody knows. My so, opinion of Beto is back to what it used to be. The phone's ringing over there, folks. The <laughs> well, phones that are ringing. also shows their concern. They That's couldn't true. even let, you know, yeah. the great influencer Beto O'Rourke to have right. his say on this. They had to completely <laughs> lock it down. Wow, Absolutely. what a what a weakling. That's so lame. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> Immediately caved. Hey, guys, if you like that video, go to breakingpoints.com, become a premium subscriber, and help us build the best independent media organization on the planet. That's right. We're subscriber-funded. We're building something new. We want to replace these failing mainstream media organizations. So, again, to subscribe, it's breakingpoints.com.